The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the host for this podcast. My husband, Steve Siegel, is the producer of the podcast. If you have a story you'd like to share with us, reach out to us. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com. Just a reminder to please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and please give us a five-star rating so that when people need help or just want to know somebody cares about them, they'll find our podcast and can listen. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel by the same name and give our videos a thumbs up. If you want to be notified of future videos, then you need to ring the bell. Today's episode is episode number 312, and that's exciting. And the reason why it's exciting is because that brings us to the close of our sixth year of weekly podcasting. We're not stopping just taking it as a milestone. We've been doing this for six years. You've been listening. We appreciate it. We hope that we've helped you. We hope that we've helped others. And that's our whole goal. So in light of that, we have an interview today. And today's interviewee is a gentleman named Sam Quinones. Sam Quinones is a journalist, storyteller, former LA Times reporter, and author of four acclaimed books of narrative nonfiction, including New York Times bestseller and National Book Critics Circle Award winner, Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic. And his most recent book, The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. Quote, the most original writer on Mexico and the border. That was from the San Francisco Chronicle. He lives with his family in Tennessee. He definitely knows what he's talking about when it comes to the epidemic of addiction. So without further ado, let's talk to Sam Quinones. Sam Quinones, thank you so much for being willing to talk to us today on the podcast. You are an expert in this area. I I mean... I almost want to say an unwilling export, but I, you know what yes. I mean. I mean, it's a, it's an right. area I feel for you being an expert, but anyway, I do appreciate <laughs> you. Thank you for talking to us. Oh, it's great. Great. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So tell us just how did you get into this area? How did you grow up and what led you down this road to be, to become an expert in the area? I, I was a, a reporter living in Mexico for many years, 10 years down in Mexico. I wrote my first two books down in Mexico. I've written four in all, but the first two were in Mexico. How I did you end up back... down there? Uh, I'm sorry? How did you end up down in Mexico being a reporter? Uh, oh, I see. You want me to kind of go back a <laughs> yeah, little go bit? go back a little bit, yeah. Uh, okay, fine. Yeah. I mean, I uh, – let me see how far back. I, I – I graduated college not really knowing what I wanted to do. And in time, I began to think, gosh, it sounds like a fascinating job, job of reporter, journalist. And little by little after college, I didn't study journalism or anything. I got into writing freelance and doing internships and finally found a, a job. And then at, at, at the newspaper, the Orange County Register in Orange County, California. And after that, though, I, I got the job that really kind of determined my life's course professionally and that was a job uh, covering crime in the city of Stockton California during the height of the crack epidemic it was a fascinating job I wow. just got fully into it and I I spoke very poor Spanish at the time but I realized that if I needed to really make myself marketable and understand California this was like the early late 80s early 90s that I needed to learn Spanish. I began to do that, and um, eventually what ended up happening was um, I I spent my time in Stockton writing four stories a day. I really learned to be a writer doing that. For four years, you do that long enough, and that's how you become a writer. You write four stories a day, basically, mm-hmm. in my opinion. I then, uh, long story short, went down to Mexico to study Spanish, found a job at a magazine down there, and stayed for 10 years writing about mostly about immigration, longer narrative type stories. And um, I I spent a lot of time in the, in the States of Mexico, which send most people to the United, to the United States. Right. I then come back in 2004 after 10 years down there, take a job at the LA times. And it's then that I see 
a year later, two years later, really, you begin to see the beginnings of the Mexican cartel drug war uh, between cart among cartels, really. Then later on, the military and the Mexican military gets involved. But I became part of a group. I was put on a, gr a group of reporters was covering that from different parts of, of, of Mexico and the United States. My job kind of was to, to talk about how drugs covered the rest of the country once they crossed the border. Wow. And it, it was part of that that I began to understand that we were seeing an enormous increase in, in heroin. And I could not understand why that would be. I thought heroin was a drug from 1970s and we had safely put that behind us and who would get back into to heroin. But I began to write about um, a group of guys from one town, this one town in the state of Nayarit, which is a small state on the Pacific coast of Mexico, where everybody had perfected a system of selling heroin retail, which is very rare for Mexicans generally try to sell wholesale. These guys were selling retail and they were selling it like pizza. Like pizza delivery, they had pizza delivery system where you would you would you would call a number, and uh, they would and and say you know I'm at the local Burger King, uh, I want five, and a guy they would have drivers driving around with little doses wrapped in balloons of, of black tar heroin, tenth of a gram doses. They come, they'd spit out five. You give them the money, they give it. And so it was a it was a system very much like pizza delivery that they had perfected in San Fernando Valley, but then expanded. They'd gone to um, many parts of the, of the West, Salt Lake City, Reno, Portland, uh, Santa oh Fe, God. and Albuquerque. Yeah, and but then I, I, they began to spread, and now by, by the time I was onto it, they were well across the East Coast. And the reason I understood that to be was because uh, of our revolution in pain management, right. uh, using uh, much more aggressively using uh, uh, opioid prescription opioid painkillers. Their story was important, I, I came to understand, because they were the first ones in the un drug underworld to recognize and then systematically exploit the coming boom that they saw in heroin wow. that grew from the widespread, very aggressive, I'd say wanton prescribing of, of opioid painkillers that doctors were then engaging in. Wow. A lot of that was new to me. The stuff about Mexico was not. I knew right. Mexico pretty well. I'd written two books. I'd been to many, many small villages like they were from. I didn't, however, know anything about, about opioids or pain management or any. I didn't know what an Oxycontin was. I'd never heard of the thing. Vicodin, right. never heard of the thing. It was, but as I understood their story, I came to realize that their new market expanding dramatically beyond what they'd ever known, just marketing only to the traditional heroin users in Salt Lake or Boise or San Fernando Valley or Phoenix was just exploding because of this. And they realized early on, I'd say 1998, they figured out what was going to happen in America. And they knew if they followed the pills, they would have an, in time a, an enormous market for their heroin bigger than they'd ever experienced before. And so wow. that was my first book. That was the story behind my first book called about this topic called Dreamland. Right. came out in 2015. As Dreamland came out, and I, was, I would say that I was stunned when it came out because while I was writing it, I was met with remarkable silence, particularly on the part of families who had addicted loved ones. Hmm. Nobody wanted to talk about this. Obituaries hid the truth. Um, you just could not get people to go public with this. Everyone thought they were all alone. And that's what allowed it to spread yep. nationwide, which is yep. really what it became. And nation because so many people were were afraid or shamed or mortified and they didn't want to talk about it. And I just assumed having dealt with this for two years, writing this book, that no one then would be interested in a book on this. But as the book came out, it was amazing to watch how it helped create this awareness of this problem that was nationwide by then, that wow. nobody had really paid much attention to other than people in certain areas like Southern right. Ohio or West Virginia, Kentucky, or whatever, right. that Maine, New Mexico, places like that. But really, it was not really well known. And I, I began to get the, the one of the barometers of that was I began to get these in, invitations to come speak all over the country. It was dramatic, amazing. We were stunned 
because yeah. that really was coming from a point of view that no one's going to be interested in this book. As I began to speak over the next few years, I began to realize that there was a new story emerging in place of the pain pills, which was gradually being curtailed as awareness of this problem grew, sometimes mm -hmm. too much, in fact, sometimes right. the uh, stepping back way too much and people who actually needed those pills couldn't get them. This was another issue. But right. um, as that began to happen, um, another and, and thing began to take place, and that was that the Mexican trafficking world discovered fentanyl. They already were making methamphetamine, and they kind of filled in that vacuum, so to speak, as time went on. And you began to see uh, synthetic drugs made illegally in Mexico take over the market that had been created by the wanton prescribing of opioid painkillers and then people graduating or 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 or, or transitioning to to heroin uh, addiction and this began to happen really in the 2012 13 with methamphetamine a new way of making methamphetamine and with fentanyl a couple three years later but by the time covid hit you had seen both of these drugs nationwide Right. Right. There was no part of the country really that did not have the story was not methamphetamine and fentanyl. Wow. We always hear that fentanyl originally came from China. Was that the case? Yeah. The first the first shipments of, Ch of fentanyl came from Chinese chemical companies and they were marketed on the Internet. They were marketing that we sell you fentanyl or sometimes a dark web, too. But you found dealers in the states where the opioid epidemic had hit first and worst like Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, et cetera, dealers in those states began to realize that fentanyl was this thing and it was like a, a, you know, a lottery ticket. You, know, you could make so much money from it. And so they began to order up small amounts, like a pound, quarter pound, you know, maybe a kilo, but rarely that much. Um, and the chemical companies would send it to them in the U.S. mail, through the international mail, getting to the United States. There would just be swamped by all the millions and millions of packages coming in from abroad every every day to the United States. And so you began to see dealers in those areas using, uh, um, uh, getting fentanyl, realizing that their lottery winnings that they had perceived were going to happen were connected up with their ability, with, with the fact that they now, for the first time really in the drug underworld, they had to actually mix what they had with another substance they had to mix it with some inert harmless powder because fentanyl was so potent that was right. the key to it it was so potent that a few grains of fentanyl would make you high a couple more might kill you right. but either way you could not sell that small amount on the street so they had to mix it with something else problem was they were really really bad at mixing they didn't know what they were doing in fact for a long time one of the chapters i deal with in my book is the the myth that spread during these years that the best way to mix your fentanyl was in a magic bullet blender, the kind that they 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 advertise on infomercials and sell at Target, uh, you know. And the truth is that that's the worst thing you could use because it uses a blade. A blade doesn't mix powders; it mixes liquids very well. It right. doesn't mix powders, but in but. These guys didn't really understand that, didn't know, whatever. And they began mixing up really bad batches, and you began to see massive concentrations of overdoses. You may remember 2014 or 15, you see 50 or 75 overdoses in a weekend in Cincinnati or Huntington, West Virginia, one of those towns. Yeah. But the 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 story didn't really end there. In fact, it evolved to the point where the Mexican trafficking world had already discovered fentanyl. It's a story I tell in The Least of Us um, uh, about a, uh, a, a underground chemist they hire to make an ingredient to met methamphetamine who decides instead, no, I know better than these guys. I'm a talented chemist. I'm going to make fentanyl. And they end up getting kind of mad at him. This is a Sinaloa drug cartel elements of that that say, you know, hey, we hired you to do this. We're funding this entire lab, very professional lab. He says, well, you don't understand. Fentanyl is the most potent stuff, most profitable stuff you'll ever see. And that's when the light goes on, bang in the mm. minds of the, of the drug world in Mexico, that there's such a thing as fentanyl, which they call synthetic heroin. 
You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727 314 Seven zero eight zero, And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. Sometimes the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 866-989-4499 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one hour consultation with Bobby. The he gets arrested. They lose that source, but they never forgot fentanyl. And years later, they learn to make it through other chemists. They learn to make fentanyl. And wow. that's when they begin to take over the real production of fentanyl. It gradually, Mexican government, I'm, I'm sorry, the Chinese government pushes very, very severe restrictions on which companies can make fentanyl. And it gradually shifts, production gradually shifts to Mexico, although the ingredients continue to come from China. Interesting. But other countries as well. Wow. And so so the Mexicans are able to make it. They're able to make it in quantities now that dwarf anything that those Chinese chemical companies could produce because the chemical companies from China are sending it through the mail at a pound at a time. Now you're talking about loads of kilos worth and and constantly every day, you know, it's a remarkable amount of fentanyl. And that's when you begin to see fentanyl move beyond the local uh, localized areas where it had been before in Ohio and Kentucky West Virginia, until it goes both the East and the West. And by 2018, you know, it's in California. First mass overdose in California was in 2018 in Chico, California. But you begin to see it spread all across the country and traffickers and dealers uh, begin to understand that, again, this is a, this is a lottery winning. If we, if we can sell it, we, we'll make so much uh, money. And that's really what begins to happen in 2017, 18, 19. You begin to see this amazing expansion of fentanyl all across uh, 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 America. The same thing, by the way, they're doing with methamphetamine. That's wow. So you've got two drugs covering the country in ways that uh, never have happened from one source. That's an unprecedented fact wow. that we've never had the entire country covered by one source, that being the trafficking world in Mexico, which is basically in a certain few states in, in, in uh, Western Mexico, covering the entire country with, with not one, but two drugs. Wow. Wow. I, I mean, we know about fentanyl. We know it's coming across the border, but you gave us the background of how that came about. It's very, it's, it's alarming. It's taken on in my opinion, not just the dimensions of a drug problem, but really kind of a national poisoning. Right. Because it's just so lethal. And it happens too, along with a few other things that happen at the same time. One is a COVID. COVID comes along just as these traffickers through 2017, 18, 19, you see these traffickers essentially covering the country, getting up into the Northeast. Uh, of the United States with methamphetamine, a drug that really was not available in those areas before then. You, you, but you also see it covering the rest of the country as well. Fentanyl is all up in there now. And so by 2020, all these, you know, there's this great, you know, shutdown and there's this isolation and um, people who are in recovery, you know, they have to go to Zoom instead of in-person 12-step meetings and and mentoring and that kind of thing. And you began to see a lot of people relapsing and the, the drugs that are then out on the street that they are relapsing into, whether they know it or not, are methamphetamine and fentanyl and maybe fentanyl in the methamphetamine or in the cocaine or whatever. And right. so that's when you begin to see, that's why you begin to see our um, record levels of 
overdose deaths that right. began 2020 and then 2021, we hit 107, 107,000. Uh, I don't know what 2022 is going to show, but I don't think it's going to be much different than 2021. Yeah. I don't think and it's so, going down, unfortunately. I, I'm not sure that it will, or if it does, it'll be a small amount because these drugs now are everywhere and you find fentanyl mixed into, into everything. But it's because of the the ability to make these massive supplies yeah. that that ability is ensured by a few things down in Mexico there's an impunity that they enjoy due to the corruption of the criminal justice system in Mexico they have control of the ports uh or at least the the they have con the ability to at least control getting the, these ingredients through the ports as well as a Mexico City airport but also it's they're they're insured this impunity is insured by a lot of the guns that are being bought here, assault weapons particularly, that are being bought here and are smuggled south. All of that combination means, allows them to produce the quantities of drugs that we are, the unprecedented quantities of drugs that we are now seeing all across uh, America uh, today. Wow. Wow. I don't think our major news media has even touched on this to any great degree. I think in large part, people are still in a COVID hangover and, and, and there's other issues that are, that are very important to the country and are trying to belittle these issues. There's the inflation, there's uh, gas prices, there's the war in the Ukraine, which I think is extraordinarily important. Um, you know, you've got a lot of things taking up people's minds. Yep. And this is, you know, just, Maybe it's a reflection of how people still view drug addiction in the in the country with a kind of a, you know, a, a it's dismissal. over there. It's not my kid. My kid's yeah, a good kid. My right. kid goes to a good school. I give my kid every opportunity. Has nothing to do with it. Exactly, and I think that there's some of that as well. And I just think the COVID hangover, part of the COVID hangover, is we don't want to deal with what seem to be intractable problems. Bad news is really, you know, we were just trying to avoid the news a lot of times. So there's a lot of reasons why this has not been recognized as a national problem, um, nor has it really been dealt with internationally, which is what I, now we just had a summit meeting between Joe Biden and uh, President of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, and uh, 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 Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada. And through that, they have decided to pay more attention to this problem. I welcome, I'd say that's <laughs> needed. It's been needed yeah. for a while. Yeah. But I also think I'm hoping that it will lead to, maybe naively hoping this, but it will lead to the kind of long-term sustained collaboration that we need on yeah. this issue of drug trafficking because this is a supply-driven story. Yeah. It's not about demand. No heroin addict ever demanded fentanyl. Right. Fentanyl is a beast. It requires you to be using all day long to keep the withdrawals away. And uh, unlike heroin, which you might take two, three times a day, now you're talking four, five, six times a day. Wow. It makes it a magnificent drug if you're a dealer or a trafficker. But as a, as a, as a user, it is a torment. Mm -hmm. And methamphetamine now, the way they're making methamphetamine or the potency with which it's arriving here, something along those lines is creating most most certainly uh, scary scary symptoms yeah. of 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 mental of of schizophrenia, mental illness that is uh, typified by extreme paranoia, delusions, et cetera, et cetera, and homelessness. So mental illness and homelessness, I think, a major driver of that is the methamphetamine coming out of Mexico. Um, in the last like 10 years or so. Wow. And and what you said about hoping that there's long-term international collaboration, you know, we've said this over and over on the podcast and I hope people get it. It's not a political problem. And so it doesn't matter who's in power in the government. Um, it is a, it is a problem that affects everybody. And hopefully, like you say, you know, this collaboration with Canada and Mexico will continue regardless of who's in office, regardless of what's happening in Washington. Your book, what's the name of your book and where do people get it? Uh, the Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. And it's available anywhere on Amazon, on all internet, on all online bookstores, and well as your local independent bookstore very easily. Okay. Thank you. 
Any last words of wisdom, Sam, that you want to share with our listeners? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Uh, what I'll say is be, get educated. And if you, you know, get the book and read the book and become smart about it and know that it affects everyone in our country. Addiction is no longer just the homeless man under the bridge. We've known that since we started the podcast six years ago. So there you go. Sam, thank you for what you do. I mean, you are confronting some pretty heavy stuff going on. I think you need to write a children's book or something, you know, just to get the other side of this. <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah, but I really appreciate you doing everything that you do um, and, and for taking the time to talk to us today because it's important and hopefully we'll get some people to pay attention. Yep, hope so too. That's my point, kind of. Yep. Wow. That's all I have to say. You know, we knew, we've talked about fentanyl, we barely touched on the problem, and here it is, laid out for you in black and white. And it's something that you need to check out. Um, his book, once again, I'm going to give you the title, is um, it's called The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. And um, I would suggest that you get it. It's by Sam Quinones. And yeah, get yourself educated. We will. We'll talk to you again next week. We'll have another interview. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.